Madam President, I rise today on behalf of over 37,000 unemployed Nebraskans and the nearly 21 million Americans who are searching for work. The vast majority of these men and women are jobless through no fault of their own. They are the real-life casualties of failed Washington policies. They are our friends, our neighbors, and in many cases, they are our family members. They are decent people, and they are desperate to regain the dignity of a full day of labor. We've had five years of economic fits and starts, glimmers of hope dashed by the harsh reality of persistent economic headwinds. But the weak job reports and the Pollyanna claims of recovery don't tell the full story. Our real unemployment rate, or the total percentage of unemployed and underemployed workers, tops 13 percent, significantly higher than the 7 percent reported by the Department of Labor in November. That's nearly 21 million people out of work. At the same time, our labor force participation rate is at 63 percent. That is a near 35-year low. The greatness of a nation cannot endure without work for its people. It's not just about putting food on the table. It's about the ability of families to buy a home, to save for their kids' college education, and to retire with a modest nest egg. It's about hardworking moms and dads in need of the simple assurance that their government isn't going to pass laws that intentionally make life harder for them. I'm interested in promoting thoughtful economic policies that increase employment opportunities and make life just a little bit easier for our people. But instead of a laser focus on job creation, Politicians in Washington seem to pivot from issue to issue, frantically chasing the topic du jour. Jobless Americans aren't interested in who's to blame. They're interested in who's going to fix this mess and how. And so the Congress has returned to Washington for a new year, a new chance to take on daunting challenges like joblessness in America. We've all been informed by the media that the so-called wise men of Washington, that in 2014, that's going to be a year where very little is accomplished. The pundits point to election year politicking. And some members are fretting about taking those very tough votes. There's no will for action, they say. There's no chance for any kind of compromise, they claim. Well, the 21 million Americans without a job are counting on us to do our job. They expect and they demand that we do better. Promoting policies to create jobs is not election year rhetoric. It is the duty of the people's government. The best way to support the unemployed is not just to extend the benefits. We need to grow the economy. We need to provide paychecks for families. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about income inequality or the need to bridge the gap between rich and poor. Some argue that deficit spending is the way to go, while others insist on increasing the minimum wage. Arthur Brooks, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, offers a different take on how to best conquer the income divide. In a July 31, 2013 opinion piece published in the Wall Street Journal, Brooks notes, quote, again and again the president offers a higher minimum wage as a solution. Yet as the overwhelming majority of economists have argued for decades, the minimum wage actually harms the poorest and most marginalized workers, those with the most tenuous grip on their jobs. In January, a study from the National Bureau of Economic Research surveyed the most recent studies and concluded the evidence still shows that minimum wages pose a trade-off of higher wages for some against job losses for others. Brooks continues, 
The story for, survive, for strivers and entrepreneurs is no better. Scott Shane of Case Western Reserve University has shown that business formation fell by 17.3% between 2007 and 2009. Launching a business is never a walk in the park, especially given the explosion of red tape at all levels of government. While it is still possible for the educated and comfortable, government bureaucracy can crush entrepreneurship entirely for those at the bottom of the income scale. As a pro-poor rule of thumb, I suggest this. If you want to start a landscaping business, all you should need is a lawnmower, not an accountant and a lawyer, to help you hack through all the red tape before setting up shop." Close quote. I think Brooks is right. Regulatory overreach is also holding back American business. Regulations can be helpful. They ensure the health and the safety of Americans. However, overregulation places unnecessary burdens on small business owners and it does stifle economic growth. A home builder in Nebraska once told me that he was fined $7,000 for leaning a ladder up against a wall. There is solid legislation out there to address this rampant red tape. Here's just a few examples. The regulatory responsibility for economy of 2013 this is a bill that was introduced by Senator Pat Roberts that I'm co-sponsoring. It requires the executive branch to repeal duplicative and onerous rules currently hindering our nation's job creators. It also requires federal agencies to modify, to streamline, or to repeal significant regulatory actions that are unnecessary or overly burdensome. The legislation ensures that regulations put forth by the administration account for their economic Im impact on American businesses. It ensures stakeholder input and promotes innovation. These simple, common sense policies are a good start towards relieving business owners of some of the unnecessary challenges they face in these already difficult economic times. I believe, and I know many Nebraskans believe, that executive agencies should be held accountable for the rules that they put in place, which directly affect our economic growth and our job creation. Another key way that we can spur economic growth is through broad-based tax reform. Our current tax system is arcane, ridden with loopholes for special interests from the 80s. It's time that we simplify our tax code so that we can encourage pro-growth behavior. Whenever I travel my state and I meet with Nebraska's business owners, both large and small, I hear the same message over and over. We need more certainty. We need more certainty. They need more certainty in the tax code. They need more certainty in health care. And they need more certainty in the regulatory environment. A business cannot grow today if it cannot adequately predict its needs for tomorrow. This is especially true for small business owners who are responsible for 64% of all net new private sector jobs. Jobs will come when these entrepreneurs have confidence that the bureaucrats are going to get off their back. Jobs won't come from just another DC government program. And so I believe that we must shift the focus of economic growth from government-driven regulation to private sector innovation. 
The great government-controlled experiment has failed us again. And so it's time for a change, of course. There's no shortage of good ideas out there. My colleagues and I have introduced dozens of bills to directly address job creation by repealing specific reg regulations, by preventing new burdensome mandates, and encouraging a fair tax system. But so far, we haven't had any form of meaningful de debate. Why? Why can't we debate in this body in a meaningful way? Well, I believe it's because we are restricted in this Senate by what we can actually vote on. It's a radical form of control, and I am tired of it. Rather than allowing an open amendment process, the majority leader has locked this place down. We hear constant calls to end obstruction. But if we're being honest, we would all acknowledge that the primary obstruction here is in the broken, non-existent amendment process. As my friend and colleague, Senator Colburn, recently noted in the Wall Street Journal, quote, Mr. Reid had already used Senate rules to cut off debate and prevent the minority from offering amendments 78 times, more than all other Senate majority leaders combined. Why? It appears designed to advance a partisan political agenda, show votes in an election year. In other words, Let's airdrop bills on the floor and prevent any form of modification or improvement. That seems to be just routine business around here these days, and it is shameful. It's my hope that in this new year, all thoughtful ideas will get a vote. It is my hope that in this new year, we'll actually get a chance to amend bills. That's the only way that we can actually pass legislation to improve the lives of the American people. I look forward to putting forth my own proposals to fulfill my duty to the people of Nebraska to get our friends and our neighbors back to work. Rather than focusing on issues that divide us, I hope that my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, will come together to support policies that promote opportunities for all. Show votes might make for good election year politics, but make no mistake, they are bad policy. And unfortunately, it is we the people who pay the steep price for politics over policy. I am excited for another year here in the United States Senate where I can represent my friends and neighbors, Nebraskans from back home. And I look forward to helping put Americans back to work in the year ahead. Our citizens, Mr. President, send us here to do a job and they're counting on us. So let's not let them down. Thank you. I yield the floor.